<laughs> Thank you so much, Simon, as I've already said, for joining us this morning. We're really delighted to have you here. It's such a treat to have a guest speaker and particularly somebody speaking on a subject that is so important. I mean, we are all increasingly aware of cyber threats and the importance of cyber security, not just for charities, for absolutely everybody, private individuals, all sorts of organizations, government, the works. But for charities and not-for-profit organizations, my sense is it is often more worrisome because generally speaking, they may not have the resources or the staff to feel really, really confident in what to do to manage cyber threats and cyber risks to the organization. And as we've seen, charities have been targeted. I mean, as recently as you know, last week, we saw things in the news about charities being targeted by cyber terrorists. So it is a, an increasingly worrying issue. Is it something that you encounter commonly, Simon, that charities and, and not-for-profit organisations worry a little bit more or find it more difficult to work out how to manage these issues cost-effectively? Yeah, absolutely. I think you, you hit it in the head there, Liz. I mean, the, we see a lot of the charity and education sector uh, clients struggle with some of their, their security just due to the, the nature of the, the, the build up. So their sort of funding constraints, knowledge constraints, and they are quite a big, quite a big target for people uh, in today's world. I mean, you, you don't really see many weeks go past now in the news or in the papers where there's not a report of a cyber attack on a charity or on a education establishment. Absolutely. So this makes today's webinar hopefully really, really topical and I'm excited myself about walking away with a few more nuggets of information about what I can do as well as what my clients can do to protect themselves. So if we just kick off with you introducing yourselves, telling us a little bit about yourself, about cyber, what got you into cyber security, and then I'm going to, to tuck myself away and enjoy the rest of the webinar as a viewer and then rejoin you at the end for some Q&A. So if I just start by asking you to introduce yourself and then I'll vanish. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, Simon Holden. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Cyber, which stands for Cyber for Bursars. Uh, and our, our mission is quite simple. It was to make cybersecurity accessible and affordable to the charity and education sectors. Uh, and we offer a comprehensive range of services from penetration testing to dark web monitoring, threat intelligence, and along with all the other consultancy services needed in between to allow an establishment to, to grow its resilience. Uh, my background. Well, it's rooted in 21 years of experience as a senior army officer, uh, working on security threats from the tactical to strategic levels across the world, and doing some pretty cool stuff along the way, dabbling with cyber. Uh, and then following my military career, I was chief operating officer for two independent foundations. Uh, and I currently volunteer as a trustee and a committee chair for a large multi-academy trust in Worcestershire. I think through these experiences, I've seen uh, firsthand how critical cybersecurity strategy and operations is, and in particular to the charity and education sectors. I'm passionate, hopefully you'll, you'll discover that as we go through this today, passionate about making cyber accessible uh, to the sectors, and I'm driven by a desire to disrupt the current ways of thinking and approaches in doing so, because it needs to be fit for purpose, not what somebody's telling you you, you must have. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Simon. OK, take it away. I'm going to vanish off the screen and I'll see you again shortly. Thank you. Uh, thank you. OK, so uh, why why charities? You may be wondering why charities are a target for cyber criminals. Uh, well, after all, it's all about doing good in the world, right? I'm trying to get the slide to work here, but it's, it's not uh, moving any further. Natalie, you may need to jump in if this doesn't work. Okay. okay, so cyber criminals think differently. Uh, they're like gold prospectors. Uh, Liz was talking about nuggets, uh, and they're always searching for valuable nuggets out there, and the charity sector is, is rich in potential. Uh, with around 200,000 registered charities and not-for-profit organisations, in the UK generating circa 100 billion in revenue. I mean, that's that's a really attractive target uh, for cyber criminals out there. Many charities hold uh, significant amounts of information, uh, that being personally identifiable information or PII, and some even hold special category data like health information. This makes them highly valuable to hackers, 
And additionally, with 31% of charity staff working remotely, often using personal devices, it becomes harder to secure and ensure compliance and security. Uh, these factors combined uh, and to create a substantial attack surface, in my eyes, and over a third of charities have experienced some form of attack. So then we sort of look at what are what are the threats to the sector as we see it at the moment. So by far the most common type of uh, breach or attack in the sector is phishing, closely followed by impersonation of organisations in emails or online. Uh, the result of these types of activities can end in a ransomware attack if they're successful. So let's sort of unpick each of these now as we as we go through them. So phishing and social engineering, uh, as I said, is by far the most common type of attack. And threat actors often engage in spear phishing, which is trying to really focus the attack into an individual or an organization. And they use information they've scraped from social media platforms like Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, et cetera, to craft target attacks either against the organization or against your uh, volunteers or employees within it. These campaigns, what, what are they about? Well, they're aiming to hijack accounts, damage reputations, or gain access to the, the network. A notable example of this was in back in 2018 with Save the Children. Uh, hackers compromised an employee's email account and tricked the charity into transferring $1 million into a fraudulent vendor. Now, while some of the funds were recovered through insurance, this highlighted just how vulnerable even major organizations with quite substantial budgets are to social engineering attacks. Uh, next one, ransomware. Uh, gone are the days when ransomware gangs only sort of targeted large corporations. Today, we see both large and small organizations face these attacks. For example, uh, Albion Housing Society, a uh, Scottish charity, was recently attacked by the Ransom Hub gang, who are quite pr uh, prolific. Uh, they had around 10 gigabytes of personal data stolen, uh, which was then published on the dark web. This shows how indiscriminate really a lot of these ransomware gangs can be in targeting charities for profit and it also highlights their their modus operandi for a lot of the gangs what they want to do steal information and then put it for sale on the dark web and some of it starts off at ten dollars and then as people start sifting through it it may end up going for tens of thousands of dollars uh, insider threats these are a major concern for charities and, and to be honest all organizations but they often go unnoticed uh, threats can come in two forms. I like to refer to them as conscious threats or unconscious threats. And with the conscious threats, they are really from disgruntled employees and unconscious threats from well-meaning but careless staff. And according to data uh, collected from the ICO between 2019 and 2023, uh, just over 30% of personal data breaches were accidental with incidents like sending data to the wrong recipient or failing to redact information before sharing. So, I mean, pretty, pretty simple mistakes to make by a human. Uh, an example of this is uh, the insider threat is the Mind Charity, which faced a serious incident back in 2020 when a former employee accessed sensitive data and leaked the confidential information uh, all over the web. Uh, this emphasizes to me, I mean, the need for strong access control and post-employment protocols to prevent insider threats, which I'll touch on later. Uh, moving down then sort of credential stealing or credential theft. Uh, this is another serious problem for charities. And I mean, as I mentioned, and it's it's one of the tools that's needed for ransomware attacks. And in 2020, uh, UNICEF Australia was targeted in a credential stealing attack, which allowed the hackers to access sensitive databases uh, by exploring a third party suppliers or uh, login and uh, getting their details. Uh, this really shows the importance of enforcing strong password management and multi-factor authentication. Supply chain attacks uh, is the sort of final one. You, you may have heard quite a lot about this and it's becoming more prevalent. And it's not just making sure you're secure, it's making sure everybody else in your chain is secure. And in 2023, Centrepoint, which I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with, uh, UK charity supporting the homeless, uh, suffered a, a large data breach due to a vulnerability uh, in its supply chain, uh, they used a subcontractor to conduct a survey, and one of their subcontractors 
uh, were accessed by uh, hackers and were able to get sensitive information. So this this sort of highlights the it's not just checking yourself or it's not just checking one remove, but potentially you need to go two, three, four into the supply chain to reassure yourself that you're happy uh, with what's out there. So, OK, what what are the vulnerabilities we see? Uh, within the sector uh, at the moment. I mean, and over our past experience with clients, this is what's really coming to light. Uh, understanding the cyber risk, and I would say this is cyber risk awareness. Uh, many boards lack a comprehensive understanding of how security and, and how cyber, uh, the risks both impact broader business areas. Uh, responsibility for cybersecurity must be clear in, in my mind. I mean, you ask yourself the question, is it managed by IT? Is it managed by security? Or is it managed by a broader governance team? I mean, I, I would sort of throw in that it's it's much wider than IT. So that probably indicates where it should sit. Uh, a lack of resourcing. Many organizations are underfunded, are underfunded and they don't fund cybersecurity uh, that well, leaving IT teams stretched thin or governance teams stretched thin without the specialist knowledge needed to manage the ever-evolving threats, which, which are happening at quite a pace. Uh, misconfiguration of information technology and operational technology, so IT and OT. Uh, many organizations operate without data equipment and software left on default settings, often with unnecessary open ports and access points. And this makes them really easy for uh, hackers or any attacker to get into. Uh, then looking at sort of lack of uh, the ability to identify an attack. And you'll see, I'll talk about this more as we, we go through, but I think many organizations struggle with identifying uh, cyber attacks in real time. Often this leads to delays in how you mitigate it. And it's if you don't have sufficient perimeter security, it allows the attackers to access the networks pretty much undetected and then traverse where they need to. And without dark web monitoring, uh, you tend to miss out on the early warnings that it is out there, i.e. is credentials or data being sold or traded or, or people talking about your organization. Humans may be a funny one to, to sort of put down there, but I think people will always be one of the the, the the weakest and most unpredictable risks in your organization when it comes to cyber or security. Uh, insider threats, as we talked about, both conscious and unconscious are significant, but remote working, poor cyber hygiene, i.e. Uh, people using their work emails to sign up for personal uh, websites. I mean, an example being my fitness pal uh, had a serious breach uh, a couple of months back, but then lots of employees have signed up to that and they pretty much always use the same passwords. So those are potentially out there now. And this, so therefore this, this increases the risk uh, of a, your attack surface. Shadow IT and users, what do I mean by this? Well, on any unauthorized software that's on the system is a, is a problem and you need to know about what's on there. And without proper control, you'll find that patching may not uh, be taking place properly or at all. And this is leaving your network exposed. And then when we look at the users, it's important to offboard your staff as soon as they're leaving, as having shadow accounts increases your exposure to cyber attacks and it also costs you money and extra licenses. And you'd be surprised the amount of organizations we come across who have got all these ghost users and it turns out they'd left months, years ago, and they're still paying a license fee for them. Uh, nearly there, suppliers. The many organizations, I feel, don't adequately check the security measures in place for their third party suppliers and who, especially those who are handling uh, sensitive data or provide critical software to your, your operations. And the final one is probably one of my, my big bugbears and it's that fear of failure. And we see all too often IT teams or leads in the organization giving us the answer, yeah, it's all fine, we're good, we don't need any support, uh, I think we've got cyber cracked. And this is down to, I mean, the culture doesn't exist for them to think it's okay to, to fail or it's okay to get assistance. And I think this is one of the greatest vulnerabilities or potentially the biggest one that's out there if it's that complacency or arrogance that, that sets in. Okay, so I've hopefully not scared you too much about what's out there and uh, what can be, what, what can attack you. Uh, let's look at some tips, how we can uh, 
remedy this. And I've broken these into two parts, considering the audience that's on today. So really, we're going to look at leadership, and then we're going to look at the doers, the, the people who will implement this. Uh, so the first one, integrate cybersecurity into governance. Uh, make it a regular item on board meeting agendas. It's something I do as a trustee, uh, and it shouldn't just be an IT issue. It's a strategic one, and it impacts every facet of the organization. So make sure it, it, permeate, or it, it permeates down into all the committees or the working groups. Uh, define the cyber risk appetite and tolerance. Uh, by this, I mean establish a clear policy uh, outlining how much cyber risk your charity can tolerate aligned with your mission and stakeholder expectations. I mean, we, we're all aware of the reporting on ESG uh, getting greater, and more and more stakeholders or I mean, beneficiaries or do, do donators are going to be looking at how your charity operates itself and what its reputation looks like. And if it's if it's if there's a risk that it could be damaged, then maybe you want to take that one a bit ser more serious on the on the cyber front. Uh, ensure adequate cybersecurity budgeting. Talked about this before in terms of finance, but allocate appropriate funds for the cybersecurity measures that you need. And that could be from training to staffing to technology. But what I would say is invest based on your understanding of the, the gaps and risks in your organization, not on the latest piece of shiny equipment or the latest trend that's out there. Uh, oversee incident response and continuity planning. Another big one of mine. Uh, Test your incident response plans and business continuity plans regularly. I mean, the average recovery time for a, a, a big incident is probably 30 to 40 days. So, I mean, ask yourself, can, can you operate without access to critical functions for that long? I would suggest probably not. And, you know I mean, close to home where I am here in, in Tewkesbury Borough Council, uh, they had an attack last Wednesday. And it took until Friday to put sort of messaging out about what they're doing, and they're still offline. They can't provide any of the essential services for the vulnerable, and they're having to put humans in community centres to try and do paper-based approaches for this. So, I mean, it, that highlights about did they actually test resilience plans if these things fall over. Uh, monitor key cybersecurity metrics. I think this goes hand in hand with the, the governance piece, but. You, you require regular reporting on the critical cybersecurity indicators uh, against the organization. So whether that be breaches, response times, vulnerability status, uh, and establish baseline metrics to, to help with this. So I would suggest, I mean, that's through penetration testing and security controls assessments or hygiene audits, and this will give you a good start state, and then you can start to, to monitor as you go. And uh, finally, Third-party uh, risk management. Ensure every single third-party supplier. I, some examples of these are like cloud storage suppliers, payment processors, information management companies uh, adhere to strict cybersecurity standards uh, through their contractual agreements. I mean, regularly review their service level agreements and their statement of works. Uh, and I mean, dive deep into it. Where are they actually storing information or who actually stores the information? Because you'll find a lot of organizations, while they're maybe UK based, they're offshore processing and then they don't, they're not governed by some of the same uh, laws. Uh, okay, so the people that are at the forefront of this and what are they, uh, how, how can they make it more secure? So configuring systems and implementing strong access controls. Uh, for me, this is this is a big one. You know what I mean, if you can understand uh, who's getting into the system, then you can sort of help protect it. So how do you do it? Uh, Role-based access control, multi-factor authentication. Uh, this provides limited access to sensitive information, especially by role-based uh, accounts. Uh, make sure your security controls are set up correctly. So firewall configuration should reflect your organization's security policies. Uh, limit the number of admin users. We see this all too often. I mean, there's lots of them. And ensure that they're, they use personal accounts for everyday tasks so as they're not exposed in that admin account. Potentially, you could adopt a zero trust approach where necessary to both users and uh, hardware. And establish a clear uh, bring your own device policy. As we go back to about the staffing within charities, mainly a lot of volunteers using their own equipment, uh, you want to ensure that it's, it's being managed right and ensure that you have a proper offboarding policy and process for whenever staff are leave the organization. Uh, 
monitor cyber risks and networks. So do this regularly to detect and respond to any suspicious activity in real time. I mean, for me, it's all about being proactive, not reactive. Uh, we see it too many times, an attack happens and nobody has known about it until the, and it could have been dealt with pretty easily if they just had been monitoring. So there's lots of tools out there to do that. You could implement tools like log monitoring or remote monitoring and management software that give you that comprehensive oversight or uh, use dark web monitoring to identify the potential threats that are out there, such as compromised credentials or typo squatting, which is where somebody will register a very similar domain, and then they use that to try and launch uh, phishing attacks and then ransomware attacks from it to either yourself or to your, your uh, clients. Regular backups, can't emphasize this enough. Uh, what you see in a lot of ransomware attacks are they will go after the backups first, and then when you get the actual the, the email saying, pay us this amount of money, uh, a lot of organizations think, oh, that's fine, I won't pay it, I'll just use my backups. But they've actually targeted the backups first, either encrypt them or they just delete them totally. Uh, so ensure you automate this process so you don't forget about it. And do it daily or weekly, depending on the, the amount of data and sensitivity you're processing. And importantly, test it. Test the recovery from a backup and store it securely, whether that be cloud-based or on-prem or both. You know what I mean? And I would suggest you want to have resilience in your backup. So a couple of copies is always good. Uh, patch management and regular updates. Regularly apply security patches and updates to protect against uh, known vulnerabilities in the, the software and systems. All This goes back to my shadow IT point. All software vendors will release patches when they find a vulnerability and it'll be pushed out. So if you, on your asset register, you know what you should be tracking for a, a, an update and Microsoft are really good at it, push it out. But some of the very small third parties, uh, they're maybe not as efficient in doing it. So you just always want to allow some time in your week to check for patch management or any new things that have come out there. Uh, cybersecurity training and awareness. This is this is a key one. I mean, and everybody's got it at the minute, and there's all various types of training. Uh, I would suggest that you sort of regularly or you regularly train staff on things like phishing and other cyber threats that we've just talked about, and identify high risk user groups and adjust training frequency accordingly. And what I mean by that, I mean you may have some risky users in the organisation who doing the, the once a year tick box cyber course just doesn't work for, they don't learn like that. So maybe they just need more of a drip feed that happens throughout the year. And there's lots of things you can do for that. Or there's just users who they don't really get it. And they're, they're maybe exposing the organization or the charity to more risk than necessary because of their, their online activity. Uh, and finally, test and audit your systems regularly. I mean, in the financial world, I mean, or in the charity, if you think of you have your yearly audit on finances, well, do this on your security, cyber security. So how can you do it? Penetration tests and audits, uh, I think, are essential. Lots of people will say vulnerability scans are good enough, but they don't really reveal, reveal the full picture. They'll show you where there's a gap, but they don't really show you what can happen or how you can traverse within it. And I, mean, I would just say, know the unknown unknowns before it's too late. Uh, I came across an interesting slide, uh, which is quite useful to, to, to sort of put it in context of how people perceive this and, and stats. So, I mean, this is from the Department of Science and Information and Technology, their breach report in 2024. And you can hopefully see, or I don't know if you can on that, there's just over a thousand charities were surveyed on this. Now, going back to my, my point about fear of failure, I mean, how many are actually truthfully answering uh, what's being asked? But it's, it's interesting to see that at the top end of it, people use specific tools for security monitoring, et cetera. That's, that's higher. But down here in the lower echelon is people don't actually aren't investing the resources in what they look like and what they then need to do to remedy it. And I think that for me is the key thing. I mean, it, it's, it's better to spend your money understanding where you need to apply the resources rather than chasing the error or the next shiny thing. And especially in the charity sector where resources aren't finite and that uh, you need to be creative with it. Okay, so 
I've told you if you need to spend all this money and uh, people are now probably panicking. I mean, how, how much is it where it is? But I mean, the good news is there's plenty of free resources out there to help you get started. And that could be from government guidance to cybersecurity frameworks. And these can guide your charity to, to, if you haven't already, build a stronger cyber defense or help you just maintain that, that posture. Uh, the NCSC, really good. They produce some really good stuff. Uh, I would say it is on the te the technical heavy end, so it's written by techies for techies. That's how I would describe it. So you just need to understand the the setup. Through it. it's not very straightforward, but it gives you good services, as the the three that I've highlighted there. Uh, the police cyber alarm service is good as well. It requires you to put an agent onto your your uh, device or your server, and then it'll track for any potential intrusions. And cyber essentials questions, I've put them on there because going back to frameworks, I think it's really good just to have some sort of framework which you're, you're basing your cybersecurity uh, policy on. And if you don't have a policy at the moment, then I would suggest you maybe look at a framework for it. Cyber, or cyber essentials is a great starting point because it ensures the basic things like cybersecurity hygiene, and it's really useful for the smaller organizations. Uh, there are others, ISO 27001 you may have heard about, and I mean, that's for organizations that probably need a more comprehensive and certifiable uh, information security management system. And I would sort of say it's not necessary for everyone. The one I really like is NIST uh, version two, which is the US uh, structure, but it, it's pretty flexible. Again, it's like ISO, you don't need it. It's uh, it's too big, but it's a really neat way of breaking things down. Now they they talk about grouping it into your policy into identifying, uh, so uh, protecting, detecting, responding, and recovering. I mean that that's pretty simple. And if you can just bucket those headings and put in how you're going to do that as an organisation, that helps you build all these policies and talking about your business continuity plans and then just your your daily processes of how you you want to work. Uh, we're there. We're nearly there. So, sort of in conclusion, I, I would say that the the best investment isn't always chasing the the latest cybersecurity trend. Uh, instead, I would uh, recommend that you need to understand where your vulnerabilities uh, lie and address them pragmatically. Uh, this allows you to focus where your resource or your focus your resources where you, they'll have the most impact. Your charity can protect its data, avoid attacks, and and most importantly is maintain the trust of your donors and beneficiaries. So before we jump on to any questions, I would say that I mean, please feel free to reach out if you have any further questions after this session or for any of the uh, accountants or, or legal uh, folk on the, the call. If you have any clients with any cybersecurity concerns, more than happy to, to chat anything through. My details are at the, the bottom left of that slide. Uh, so I think that's, that's me hopefully on time. And uh, now for some questions. Thank you so much, Simon. That's been really, really enlightening and some fantastic tips there and particularly grateful for the links to the various free uh, cybersecurity tools that you included on the slide there. The slides will be available. They'll be sent out to everybody who registered, everybody who's watching this today. So you will be able to see uh, those slides if you didn't manage to grab a screenshot or, or jot down those website addresses while Simon was speaking. So I've just got a question here, Simon. Uh, what is the most common trap that even well-prepared organizations fall into when assessing their cyber resilience? Uh, testing their plan is what I would say. I, I mean, to sort of expand on that a bit more, I think that a lot of organizations we come across, and even, even in the commercial sector, I mean, they've got really big IT teams or security teams, and they build their resilience plans internally. and a lot of the time, nobody has to look through the lens of the attacker and how they're trying to do things. But more importantly, it's just testing your plan. You I mean, coming from the military, it's all about planning. And it's not about the plan. It's about the planning process because no plan survives contact. It will always go wrong. But if you haven't thought about it and haven't pulled out the threads, and I'll give you an example. I mean, on people's risk registers, and I'm sure everybody will be able to serve uh, reference this you'll have a line on there which says cyber and it's probably a red box and that maybe has broken down into it impacts finance or somewhere else but you might have it affects operations and 
the line to how you reme or re remedy it will be uh, call this number or call this third party provider. But has anybody ever called that number or ever checked that that, that actually works? Because you'll find that the time when it all goes wrong, it's Murphy's Law creeps in, isn't it? And that number doesn't work anymore. That person has now moved about five years ago and it's not there. So just, I would just say, just keep testing your plans. Do, do the regular drumbeat, you know, maybe every quarter get the senior leadership team and the, the key people that are going to be involved in an incident to, to just run through the plans. Great. So somebody's just uh, clarifying the four steps you identified. First, identify. Then I think this was from one of those free resources that you listed. Oh, sorry. Yeah, from, well, it's from, from yeah, NIST. Uh, mm -hmm is to identify. So you want to understand and manage your cybersecurity risks. Uh, so to systems, to assets, to data, to capabilities. So that's your risk assessment, really. And then you want to protect. So implement safeguards to ensure you can deliver your, your critical business or infrastructure. And then you want to be able to d detect. And remember, I was talking about being able to, on the perimeter, see what's coming. So implement processes to identify cybersecurity incidents. Then you want to be able to respond. And that's developing the ability to respond to those what that incident is and that goes back to my point about testing planning and then recover develop your resilience plans how are you going to restore services and i mean i give you that example of chicksbury borough council at the moment you know what i mean and and some some companies are offline for maybe a month two months and that could have significant impact on on reputation uh they're all there i can i can put the link to nist in the in the chat that might be be useful and uh, somebody else has written, um, they don't have a question, but they just wanted to thank you very much for the narrative and the information, which is really nice to see. So there's a, a nice big thank you there. And then just to, to wrap up, um, a final question from me, which is for charities that, that do have quite limited resources and perhaps don't have a dedicated IT employee or somebody who can, who can, who has that tech capability within the organization. Are there services out there for outsourcing this? Are, are they cost effective? Um, are they as good as having somebody within an organization? What would be your top tips if you don't have an IT person within your, your charity or, or school or organization that can sort of pick all of this up? Uh, yeah, so they're, they're in turn used quite a lot fractional uh security staff or fractional security officer or fractional security manager it could be any of those but i think it's a really cost effective solution i mean it, it's obviously we offer one but many people do uh, and what it allows you to do is get that proper expertise at a fraction of the cost of an fte mm -hmm. uh, equivalent and it's always somebody that's at the top of their game as opposed to maybe you start becoming uh, hitting your knowledge ceiling uh, I would just always do, do, due deal, do, do your due diligence when looking for them. Uh, lots of, there, there are things called uh, managed service providers, which are many organizations will have them. They provide your computers, your networking, your printers, your, I mean, software, everything else. And some of these will say they do cybersecurity. Uh, I would just question that and have a look at it. And I mean, I would say, if you want to do cybersecurity, get a cybersecurity company. If you want to do networks and printing, Get a networking printing company uh, but it's definitely a more cost effective way and you'll find that lots of organizations work from that could be one day per month one hour per month i mean 30 days per month you know, i mean it's it really depends on what you need uh, but we sort of tend to find most of our clients for that it, it, it operates on a it's a bit of heavy lifting at the start and then it tapers off. So you might find there's maybe three or four days a month for the first two months or so, and then they drop down to maybe a day, or even it's a bank of ours where they can pick up a pick up a call. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us, Simon. I'm really grateful, and I hope that everybody's found it as useful as I have. Um, take care, have a fantastic rest of your day, and thank you very much to everybody who's watching for staying with us through to the end. Thank you. Thanks very much. Take care.